Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. We've been waiting on you, and we're ready to go. We thank our Father for blessing this great nation, America, for giving us the many blessings. You know, we just don't take the time to count our blessings. Well, some will say, well, God never does anything for me. Well, hey, if you're a part of this nation or one of our neighbors that lives in this hemisphere, you've got so many blessings you couldn't count them all if you started tomorrow morning early and counted all day. We are so fortunate in this hemisphere. I thank our Father for it, and I thank him, that he gives us the ingenuity to be able to spot elements from the other hemisphere that would try to pollute this hemisphere. We thank him for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We continue our study in this book of Psalms. How precious they are. Now, we come to Psalms 33. And I want you to listen real closely. I don't want to complicate this. But this Psalms 33, if we were to title it, is his people's new psalm in view of Psalms 20. Now, this is important. What happened in Psalms 20? You'll remember the last three psalms have been in view of it. It was Jacob's time of trouble, which would happen in the final generation, which is to say now, in this generation. It had to do the Selah with meditating a moment. And to remember the price that was paid in Psalms 22, where Jesus was nailed to that cross for you. He became the lamb slain. Now, what is so important about this psalm? Let's go a verse or two, and I'll call it to your mind. Okay, Psalms 33, verse 1, and it reads, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is common for the upright. You should do it. It's beautiful for the upright to give praise where it belongs. Two, praise the Lord with harp, singing unto him with the psalm string and an instrument of ten strings. You bring out the whole orchestra in praise of Almighty God. Now, verse 3. Let's go one more. We're going to have a little commentary here. Verse 3. Sing unto him a new song. Underline it in your mind. A new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. You sing with a loud noise. Now, stop and think a moment. Remember Revelation 15? That chapter in the book of Revelation where the overcomers, those that had overcome the mark of the beast, in other words, they were not deceived by it. Those that had the victory over Antichrist were singing two songs. One, and probably my favorite, was the Song of Moses, which is written in Deuteronomy chapter 32, taking in the last verse of 31. It's a song that every Christian should know and understand the in-depth meaning, or you're not in too good a shape right now. Because it's the song and the theme and the instructions to the overcomers. Now, the second song was the song of the Lamb. Did I not just tell you that this reverts back in view of 20 to the Lamb slaying? This is that new song, the song of the Lamb, in part. Therefore, it's a very important psalm to you. It points with wisdom and knowledge to that place of the overcomers. Listen to it closely. Four. For the word of the Lord is right. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. The word of the Lord is right. That's one of the subjects of this song. And all his works are done in truth. No halfways, no confusion, no babble. All of God's works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. You want to get in good with the Father? Listen to me. 
The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And so it is. How precious. Six. By the word of the Lord. I want to read that again so that you don't miss it. By the word uh, of the Lord uh, were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. That is the breath of life. By the very breath of life. What is this host? It's the host of his angels. His people. Which is very breath. Were you made? Your soul. The soul that came from him and entered the that embryo of your mother's womb. He created you. He is your father by this word, his word. You see the kinship? You see the reason that you should never, never turn your back on him and why you should count your blessings that he bestows upon you. Seven, he gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the debt in storehouses. I think this loses something in the translation, and I'm going to correct it. The Septuagint, I'm not too sure that the Vulgate doesn't back me up in this as well, because it definitely is referred to as a, a wine skin or a skin bottle, not, not wine, drop the word wine, but a skin bottle. Do you, you understand what I'm talking about? The bottles in which they carried wine. In other words... You see the simplicity then, the ease, probably better said, that God gathers the sea up as simple as you would if you were to pick up a wineskin. And, uh, well, if you don't know what a wineskin is, picture a hot water bottle. Just pull it. You can squeeze it here and there and manage the water within that bottle. Or if you want to go a little oversized for the human being, a water bed. All right? He controls it in that manner. It's that easy for him. Verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Respect him and fear if you're evil. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And you should. Because he is the creator. And when you look up in the heavens, you see the stars that he placed there as another witness of his words. The Bible and the stars then how can you help but stand in awe of our Father? Our Father is really something. Verse 9. For he spake, and it was done. Like that. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's all that was necessary for him in the creation of the firmament. Now, this psalm is divided in two parts. The first ten verses, or up to the tenth verse, was of praise. Now comes the declaration concerning Yahweh. Let me say it again. From this point forward comes the declaration that concerns your father, Yahweh. Ten, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. It doesn't matter what kind of armed forces some earthly king uh, that, is, that separates themselves from the living God might put together. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans as far as our Father is concerned. Eleven, the counsel. You need some counseling? You listen to me. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. How long? Forever. The thoughts of his heart, that is to say, better translated, his mind to all generations. How many generations? All. That includes you. This generation. All his thoughts refer to each and every generation. But bless your hearts, even the prophets wish to live in this generation when these things come to pass that you see coming to pass that consummate the end of this age. The fig tree, 48. And the various prophecies that have been fulfilled since that time in the minor prophets as well as others. The counsel of the Lord. How, how does the Lord counsel you? By spirit and from his word, it was written to you. Not to the masses, but each individual, it was written to you. Each individual is a child of the living God. Twelve. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
In the Hebrew, this is Es Yahweh. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. For his what? For his own inheritance. Can you place that nation or those nations today? Let's take, first of all, this great nation, America. You got a piece of corn in your pocket? Take it out. Read it. Does it not say, in God we trust? A nation, even on its current thing. Oh, I know she's got a lot wrong with her in some places, but still, our very constitution, the document under which we try to live and maintain our great nation, was formed in God we trust, our Father. He, that pleases him. That's why God blesses America. That's why God blesses the nations of this hemisphere. God's chosen, the superpower of the free world, and I'm not taking away from our neighbors, I simply want to say the superpower of the free world, with Russia embedded in communism, we're certainly not talking about that nation, you won't pull a coin out of your pocket in Russia if you're able to have one, and have it read, in God we trust. If anything, there would be blasphemy against God written upon it. Now, there isn't, but I'm saying if, if a choice was made. For blasphemy against God is to say God doesn't exist. And so it is in that nation. Oh, I love the Russian Christians. What a price they pay for Christianity. The danger of being arrested. The danger of being shipped, annihilated to a place of, of confinement to be ostracized from the better jobs. That's the price of being a Christian there. How fortunate we are in this hemisphere that you can speak your mind concerning your religion. It happens to be one of the guarantees in that Constitution through the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion. 13. The Lord looketh from heaven. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all, you underline it, all the sons of men. That means all humanity. He observes them. Well, this was written way in the Old Testament. No, didn't we not just read to all generations? Don't you try to pull away because we're studying in the Old Testament and the Psalms that it wasn't written to you. Time means nothing to our Father. It concerns you. He sees you. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all, underline it again, all the inhabitants of the earth. He is able to observe you. God never hears me. Oh, yes, he does. He not only hears you, he sees you. Kind of an awe-inspiring inspiring thought, is it not? Think about it. Think about it. Perhaps it will help you please him more. 15. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. He's familiar with all their works. You understand God is familiar with your work. God knows your work and how you work for him. Is he proud of you? The first part of this verse, I cannot let it stand. It should read, he who fashioneth their hearts together. In other words, he made them all. Not that he made them all alike. That's a mistranslation. They are all of one and one of all. But they are each singular. In other words, the word heart should not be plural. Let me read again what the first half of the verse should read. He who fashioneth their hearts together. He considereth all their works. He knows what you do for him. He knows what you do toward him. He knows what your thoughts are in relationship to your love for him. And he loves you in return with judgment, which is to say with either reward or criticism. But don't worry. You could not, with your human mind, nor could I with my human mind, be able to fathom the patience that he has with each of us. 
for we all disappoint him. There's not one perfect among us. We are all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And he sees it. It's rather an humbling thought when you stop and think about it. For your father sees. He knows. He knows. You can't con him, nor should you ever want to try. But with his patience and his love, he's able to forgive. Not only is he able to forgive, but bless your heart. In the personage of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, in Psalms 22, as it is written, Ela, Ela, Lama, Shabbatine, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He quotes that psalm of how he would die on the cross for you. Are you worth it? Hmm? Is, are, are your works that you do for him, do they come anywhere near comparing to the worth of his love and the price he paid for you, if you will only believe. Think about it a moment. He loves you. It's, it's a wonderful thing that he does love sinners and has patience. For if he judged by the rule of man, which is intolerance, no patience, then we would all be in trouble. Verse 16, there is no king saved by the multitude of an host. There's no king saved because of the size of his army. Doesn't have anything to do with it. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. It doesn't matter how strong a mighty man is. He's not delivered by his strength, by any army, or anything of that wise. <clears throat> 17. And horse is a vain thing for safety. It was, uh, the horse was a quite a, quite a, thing to have a steed that could allow you to outrun all men, an entire army, and escape. But not even that could deliver you. You could, If you were to update that to this day, the fastest jet in this nation will not help you. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Not only can the mighty strong man not deliver himself, he can't deliver anybody else. How futile man is. Vanity, vanity, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I think of the Proverbs. I think of Ecclesiastes, rather. As I think of man in the flesh upon this earth, for that's what the book addresses. 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Those that revere him, better translated. He knows you. He singles out with love, those that respect him and love him. Upon them that hope in his mercy. Do you know what hope is? Hope is for his faith in something unseen. In other words, hope to a degree is faith. Those that faith in the Lord. He sees it. He knows it. Do you understand? Your work that you do for him, he sees. He Observes, he knows. 19. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Now you hold it a moment and you use your mind. <clears throat> what is it written in Amos chapter 8 verse 11 concerning the famine? You, you make a note of that. Don't let it slip away from you. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, what was the famine of the end time? The famine of the end time would be for hearing the word of God. Did we not find back in verse 6, by the word of the Lord? Did we not hear in verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right? It is his word, his counsel, that is the food through hope, faith in him that brings deliverance. that doesn't cause you to go hungry. But he feeds you meat in due season. He prepares a table of choice food before you right in the very presence of your enemies. His word, his truth, his counsel. Verse 20. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. Does yours patiently? You got the patience? Can you put all your trust in him and know that he sees you when you're in trouble? Hey, you can trust him, can't you? Don't you? He is our help and our shield. Shield is faith. Gospel armor, 
Ephesians 6, 21. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because he, because we have trusted in his holy name, Yahweh, our Father. 22. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee, as we have faith in thee. How much faith do you have? I want you to hear that again. I want you to be sure and understand it, because it all hinges on that. Let me read it one more time. Let thy mercy, O Lord, that's God's forgiveness, his love, his mercy, his blessings, be upon us, that is to say, his children, according, see there's a qualification, according as we hope in thee, according to our faith in thee. You got to believe it, friend, or it's it's not real. It's real, but it's not real for you. It won't work for you if you don't believe. You got to know that he did create you with his word. He spoke it. It was so. His very breath. Do you understand? If I may put it this way, and and I trust that it, I'm sure it would not offend him. His very life and breath created your soul with you. There is a kinship there, a love, a parent in you, the love of a parent flowing from him to you. You are his. And he will grant mercy to you. He will grant blessings to you only and according to your faith in him. Okay. Psalms 34. That's a beautiful psalm. How I love them. I understand in the last lecture I was in pudding instead of imputing, and I got corrected for it. Sometimes I, my mind gets a little ahead of my tongue. Forgive me for that. Psalm 34. This is an acrostic psalm. It's important. I hope we're able to cover the entire psalm, and I'm, I fear we won't, but maybe we can get at least half of it. Let me read the title and give that explanation, and then I'll explain the acrostic. It's not difficult, therefore don't make it difficult, but I do want you to take notes. Psalm 34, a psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, the Philistine king, who drove him away and he departed. Abimelech means the king of Gath, or the king of the grape, a uh, wine press, rather. The king of the father, Achish happened to be the Philistine king at this time, and his name means angry. Now, there are 22 verses in this psalm, and you with companion Bibles will note that you have a Hebrew letter of six before each verse, therefore setting it aside as a Hebrew, I'm sorry, as a, an acrostic psalm, meaning that God has a special message hidden within the psalm. It is divided into sets of 11 with one drop, meaning there are 11 verses which make up the 22. The first 11 um, uh, having to do with praise, and the last 11 verses having to do with instruction. And, beloved, it is instruction that is ever so important. Now let me explain the acrostic, whereby you will understand how important it is. I'm sure I'll have to do this in the next lecture, but be that as it may. The, the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, is complete with the exception of one letter, and it is dropped. The letter is Va, or V, one of the consonants of the sacred name of our Heavenly Father, but still leading within the consonant of Ya. One letter is, with Va being dropped, P is inserted two times to draw attention to the scholar of a very important thing. I will explain why pit is so important when we come to that place. Again, the first ten verses praise. Let's get cracking. Verse 1, Psalms 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise uh, shall continually be in my mouth. David speaking. Now, this doesn't mean you're a religious fanatic. It means that your faith in him is never absent. It's always present. Two, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. 
If I'm going to boast about anything, it'll be about my father. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. They're going to see his love and my love for him. Three, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We can do that, beloved. That's what fellowship in our Father is. Four, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Now, the people read over that. People get all shook up on their first cruise. They don't know from come sick them. Sometimes they're so frightened that some little piddling thing of this earth, age, when you have the power and the might of Almighty God looking down upon you with the angel of God at his command to protect you. Now, come on. Delivered from all my fears. He'll do it. Five, they looked unto him. That's the father. And were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Listen, don't look around. That'll sidetrack you. Don't look within your own self. That's miserable. But keep your eyes on the Lord. Look within him, within his word, in his word. Find the truth, the comfort, the counsel that will never lead you astray. Picture Peter, if you would, as he stepped from the boat, kept his eyes on Jesus, walked on the water, took his eyes off of Jesus for one moment, looked at the angry waves, and down he went. Keep your eyes on Father's word. Keep your eyes on him. Six, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. He hears you. And he saved him out of all his troubles, and he'll save you out of your troubles. You don't have to worry. Can you have faith to know that of a reality? Don't pray, Christian. Christian is, is not a belief or a religion. It is a reality. Verse 7, listen closely. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, those that reverence him. Did you hear me? The angel of the Lord encampeth about those that love our Father and uh, delivereth them. What are you worried about? Do you understand the power in the mind? This is his promise in an acrostic. And when, when we make the whole acrostic, you will understand. Eight, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Can you do that? Taste it spiritually. Don't, be, don't die in the famine. Taste the word. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. That's what it's all about. Nine, O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. That's those that are set aside, his elect. For there is no want to them that fear him. And you want, if you'll trust, you'll have it. Be patient. We come to the second part of the acrostic following this next verse, which is instruction. Do you want to be instructed by your father? Do you want to sing that new song? Then listen and take counsel from Almighty God, not this man, with as little commentary as I can possibly get by with, we're going to cover this psalm. I will not stop teaching this psalm because of the acrostic. Verse 11, the young lions, that's the strong lions, do lack and suffer hunger. In other words, the young lion, as vicious as they are, is the best hunter. And even they go hungry at times. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. It will all be given to you. In other words, we inherit it in the eternal friend. For we inherit the Father. That is to say, the saints, the set-aside ones. Eleven, and the break of the acrostic, listen and learn from your Father, and you'll make it. Come, you children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the, the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord. If you will listen to this teaching, You'll be there. You'll understand. Twelve. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may be good? What man is it? Thirteen. Keep thy tongue from evil. Can you handle that? And thy lips from speaking guile. Do it. You have no place nor business uh, in that camp. Fourteen. Depart from evil and do good. Now listen. If you'll do these things, you'll never want for anything. It's a promise from Almighty God and His angel there to give it to you. Now wake up and listen. Seek peace. Who is the King of Peace? The Prince of Peace? Jesus. Uh, seek peace and pursue it. Don't always look for trouble, gossip, etc. 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. He sees you. 
and his ears are open unto their cry. When you ask, he hears. Do you understand? 16. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. He's against your enemies. You don't have to be against them. He is, and he is all-powerful, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, and so they shall be in the eternal life. They just won't make it. They just won't be there in these very simple um, requests that he makes of you. Follow them and you will be. 17. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. How many of their troubles? All their troubles. Well, he didn't mean, well, you're still living, aren't you? Well, yeah, it passed. Well, what do you think caused it to pass, friend? Your worry? Do you think that's what did it? No. It was the hand of Almighty God that took you through it. If you have any love at all for him, he will not go back on his word. Your worry doesn't do anything but shorten your days on this earth and cause you to be a less faithful servant to him. 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Those that are humble and say, Father, I'm sorry, I've messed up a few times. Help me to do better. 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Did you hear me? Many are the afflictions. God knows that Satan's going to bring them on you, but God will deliver you out of every last one of them. Did he say here, you're going to have a lot of afflictions and I'll deliver you out of most of them? No, he said all of them. So stop your fretting. 20. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. You know that he did not have a bone broken in his body as he hung on the cross, directing back to Psalms 22, the Lamb. Also, it has a deeper meaning for you as well. The bones are the members of your body. He's looking forward also onto the many-membered body. He will not let one of them be harmed. Do you hear me? He will not let one of them be harmed. 21. Evil may slay the wicked. I'm sorry. Evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. They're gone. Satan's already condemned to death at the end of the millennium. If you're following him, you're following a short timer because he's about out of here. He's about gone. Now, we come to the 22nd Psalm, which has the double pit. Pay, rather. By that I mean it has a P, the second P in this acrostic, for a very important reason. And you listen to me. Listen to the verse 22. The Lord redeem us. Do you know what it means to be redeemed? That's purchased. That price that was paid in the 20th verse was not a bone being broken on the cross. It was paid for your redemption. The acrostic points to it and anchors it. The redemption the Lord redeemeth the souls of his saints, not the flesh bodies, the souls of his saints, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. None of them will be lost. Not one soul that trusteth, that loveth the Lord, he will bring you through all your troubles. Why were there two pays and the va missing? Because et Yahweh. Now, this may sound complicated because I'm going to use a little Hebrew. Don't allow it to. That's the full name of the Father. The the taken away, which is the V, shortening to Yah, and bringing in the lamb slain, Yeshua. But why the double P? I'm going to stop saying P so that you understand I'm saying that, that simply is P, the letter P. Because the word Pedah, is used in the last verse of this Psalm 34. What does Pada mean in the Hebrew tongue? P-A-D-A-H. It means redemption with power. I want you to look back. In, in that acrostic it is, I want, I just, I'm going to take just one more moment. You will remember that the 45th Psalm was an acrostic Psalm as well. I mentioned Pada. Look, the last verse in the 25th acrostic psalm again. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Padah, redeem with power. Christ paid the price in Psalms 22 to do exactly that. Don't you love him? 
And isn't it wonderful to be able to look deeper into the Father's words to pull these points that are double guaranteed from his words for your redemption. Don't let me catch you worrying. Oh, I know you have troubles and I'm your pastor and you bring them to me. But I know where I'm going to take them. I'm not going to worry about them. I'm going to turn them right over to him because I can't do anything about them. He will. He has promised. Bless your heart. She lists in a moment. I want to share something with you. The Companion Bible. Of all Bibles, I recommend this as a study Bible. You know, we have the King James, and it's a beautiful work. Here's the King James with a parallel column. Leather bound, and in the back of this wonderful Bible, you have 198 appendixes. Appendix taking you into 198 in-depth studies. Now, as an example, Genesis. Uh, now we go to the front of the, the companion Bible. In Genesis, uh, you see eight verses, and then you see explanation in the column. Beloved, you as an English reader, it takes you back into the Hebrew, allowing you to see and understand that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. That millions of years passed. Or in verse 2, Tuhu Babuhu. Yes, you, the English reader, can read the Hebrew from the manuscripts showing you how that the world became void and without form, not that it was created void and without form. A Bible that any English reader can easily understand. You see it there on your screen. I hope you can make that out. Tuhu Babuhu. It became waste. So here you have a study tool that takes you from the milk and puts you into dead center meat. Um, and how precious it is to have those tools available, including Nasara, including um, um, including those appendix that go into so much depth, so much truth. We just thank our Father for this beautiful Bible. It is yours for a donation of $100 to the chapel to help you study deeper, more depth into God's Word. Okay, bless your heart. $100 gift in the Bible. We just want to send it to you. God bless you. All right, bless your heart. We're back. Say, hey, let's get the 800 numbers up at this time. There you've got them. 1-800-643-4645. In this great state of Arkansas, 787-555-6. You got a question? You got a thought? You got a comment on that song? Hey, let the spirit move you. Get on the horn, pass the note up to the pastor. Once you do that, let's get into our prayers. Prayer for a grandmother, 67 years old. She's dying of cancer. Wants the Lord to show him how to be comforted. Oh, he'll do it. I hope that that song this evening helps you. We'll ask him to look down upon her as well. Diana from Diane, rather, Diane. A prayer for a chronic uh, pancreas condition. Knows the Lord is with her. He certainly is. Father, you hear the cries and the requests of the children. You, it is your promise. You do. We know it. We have that faith to know that as credentials to your word being true, heal in Jesus' uh, precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Dwayne from Michigan. You prayed for a friend of mine, Ray Edwards. He had a drinking problem that said that and they said his liver was gone and he couldn't live in the ambulance for a 100-mile trip. He is now walking on the beach, gets blood every eight days instead of every four hours. God does answer prayer. Well, Dwayne, thank you. He sure does. That's his credentials to his truth. We thank him and love him for his word. He's somebody you can really trust. He's somebody you can really put your faith in, beloved. He's real. And you are too. You're one of his children. Veronica from from um, um, somewhere um, just started watching. Oh, Maryland. All right, from Maryland. Which day is Sabbath? Saturday or Sunday? Document, please. That's real easy. Second, in Colossians chapter two, it tells you that Christ put the Sabbath on the cross with Himself. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm talking to God's elect now, not just God's elect. The one, word, the one word to the wise is sufficient. Hebrews 4 declares that Sabbath, meaning rest, Christ is our only rest, and if you are one of his elect, separated ones, 
you are a priest, and you are in one day from now until the end. The same as the day was lengthened to never have night. You're not a child of the night, nor will you ever go through a night. You're in one total day in him, and he is your rest. Okay, first time caller, First Peter 3.20, eight souls saved on the ark. You said others were on the ark. Please explain. It said that eight souls, the sons of Adam, Adamic man, were saved on the ark. That is true. And personally, in my opinion, that's all that were on there. But you didn't hear me say there were others. I said it would be very possible and the scriptures allow that there were others, for God created all the races except Adam. Uh, this is excludes hybrids on the sixth day. There were other flesh on this earth, other people. Noah was told to take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Genesis 6, just before the instructions were given, God said, man has now become flesh as the others. So, two of every flesh uh, could also very well mean two of every race. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't mean exactly that. I still believe it was not in that way. I do not believe that the flood was worldwide. Harry from North Carolina. I'm not, it, but that's my opinion. Now, don't ask me to document it. That's from years of study and um, so forth. Harry from North Carolina is, instead of Jesus, now, for you that are not familiar, this is Antichrist in Greek. It means instead of the true Christ. Is instead of Jesus on the earth during Matthew 24 as 7 and 8. As I'm going to say that you probably ask as soon as verses 7 and 8. No, you, this was when the warning was building of the political system that will be just before he appears. I think you will see him showing up in verse 9 when you are delivered up before him. Why can you only travel three quarters of a mile on Sunday? Because they still went by the, the Hebrew law, and you were only allowed to go that far on a Sabbath day to walk to church, and that's as far as you could go. It was Call it a figure of speech if you want, as far as you're concerned today, but it meant that three quarters of a mile wouldn't be far enough to be away from Jerusalem when Christ is ready to turn it to sand. And destroy Antichrist. Tommy from Georgia, please explain why God chose the olive tree and its oil for anointing. Why do they use unleavened bread at Passover? I think I'm going to take the unleavened bread first because God tries to teach us how we should eat and what is good for us. Leaven is yeast. Yeast built up in the body will make you very sick. Some even believe it's part of the cause for cancer. Why did God choose the olive tree? Uh, I'm going to borrow from Dr. Alexander in part on this, and praise God, we're going to have him here before too long. Don't you give up on us. We've been building a, radio, a television station in between getting Ray up to do some amazing graces, and we're a little delayed, but we're going to make it. But um, the olive oil is one of the only facts that is not harmful to the human body. I'm going to say that again. The olive oil is one of the only oils or fats that is not harmful to the human body. All other fats basically are. That's why God, uh, taking from Dr. Alexander, that's why God said concerning sacrifice, you eat the meat, but leave the fat for me. It is mine. Because the human body can't take it. All rich men's diseases are caused from overeating and fat. Uh, the olive tree is so rich, and it's it's the medicinal purposes that make it that clear oil that is both healthy and pure. Michael from Texas, Nehemiah verse chapter 5, I suppose, a great cry against the people and their wives against their brethren, the Jews. Why was there such a cry? Were the Jews that were taken away the only pure Jews left upon their return? Daniel was one of them. When Daniel fasted, he didn't eat meat. Would uh, being a vegetarian 
have anything to do with clearing the mind. Well, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to fast occasionally. You, and there you do away with all. Uh, you should eat very little meat. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave the rest of that for Dr. Alexander. Uh, I'm going to let him answer that. Uh, he'll tell you exactly how much meat you can eat and uh, have your body healthy along with other things. The um, Nehemiah chapter 5, if I remember right, if you'll go on over, uh, oh, drop down to about the 10th, 11th verse, where they're be being taught, they're, the reason they were in a cry is there was a famine on. And in relationship prophetically, it could be a famine for truth, but they, they committed a great sin against God in doing that. They began to sell everything they had and borrow against what they had to buy food to store. And they partook of usury, even to their own brothers. That displeased God very much, and that was the sin thereof. Uh, no name from Alabama. Pastor Murray, explain the seals of Revelation 6, in chapter 6. My, that's an hour and a half discussion. Um... The Matthew 13, Matthew 24 and the Mark 13 tapes will go into detail. The Revelation, the seals in chapter 6, as they are opened, you'd better learn why they were placed there in chapter 7. The end was held until the seal of truth was placed in the minds of the people that were supposed to hear. Those seven seals are the seven events that are mentioned in Matthew 24 when Jesus was asked, what will it be like at the end of this earth age? Those seven seals are the events of chapter 6 of Revelation. You're supposed to have those in your mind. That is the mark of God in your forehead rather than to receive the mark of the beast in your forehead. The mark of the beast in your forehead is to be tangled up in the deception of these end times to accept instead of Christ. That is to say, the first supernatural that is able to perform miracles upon this earth, when he comes to say, I've come to carry you away, which is commonly taught, but the majority will be caught up in the apostasy. Let me ask you something. We know that the, the apostasy is a terrible and an awesome thing by people that follow the son of perdition, that lead Christ, their true Lord. If all the Christians are gone, there's no apostasy or changing. They're serving Satan anyway. Who is it then that commits this great apostasy? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm speaking of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It reads very clearly, and, and Peter, uh, Paul rather is warning very uh, sternly don't let my first letter to you Thessalonians deceive you. For that day of Christ's return shall not happen. He's not coming back here to rapture you away. Except there come the apostasy first. It's going to happen. Millions of Christians are going to fall away at the appearing of the son of perdition. That is the apostasy. It's going to happen. Frank from New York. In Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, how do you determine that the first one taken will go to the Antichrist? Frank, because Greek, Greek is a very wonderful language, as well as the Hebrew. It's not like English. It doesn't shift or move. with the, Like if I tell you my boat is fast, you don't know whether it's tied fast to the dock whether it's fast in the water or whether it's stuck fast in the mud. English is a tricky language. You, you don't know from come sick them many times. Greek's not that way. Once a subject is given, once the object is given, you cannot change it. The subject of Matthew 24 is what? Deception by Antichrist. Jesus even goes to the point, don't worry, not if, not maybe, Antichrist and the false prophet will come. They're coming first. That will be the first tribulation. And some of your mothers and your fathers are going to cause you to be delivered up before him. You know why? They're going to, your mothers and fathers are going to think it's Jesus. And they're going to ask him to have mercy on you. He's going to have mercy on you, all right. 
Therefore, you stay in the field working. Don't you go flitting up there to him, the first one. Or you're already in bed with Antichrist. You're that Jezebel written of in the church that whores after him. You're part of that great harlot, the Christians that whore after Antichrist in deception. That's why Greek is a fixed language. Men play tricks with it because they're ignorant of it. And that, maybe that's a strong term. Ignorant in the Greek thinking means they're not informed. So they're not informed. Carol from Texas. St. John 3, 5. I understand that being born of water refers to the womb, but what is being born of the spirit? Okay. Man's spirit is the intellect of man's soul. In other words, your spirit is that part of you with which you think, with which you plan, with uh, your intellect. All right? When your intellect accepts Christ, is it not written in John, as you go from 3.5 down to 3.16, God so, 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe upon him would not perish. That means burn in hell. Look, look that word perish up in the Greek, the manuscript, which it means to whew, disintegrate but have eternal life, not everlasting. Eternal is what the manuscripts say. And the Greek is such a beautiful language compared to English in this respect. Eternal means from the beginning for God's elect. So when your spirit accepts the spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, and marriage, in a sense, is created there, and you receive the Spirit. It's that simple. It's when your intellect takes the love of God, okay? Um, okay, George from Virginia. Uh, what is the, what is it to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? It is to, to deny the Holy Spirit a, 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 an opportunity to speak through you when you're delivered up. Very few will have the privilege of of, uh, of even being able in a position where they could commit that sin, for it is the unforgivable sin. Vince from Minnesota, how do you know when your name, when you're, you, how do you know when you have been baptized with the Holy Ghost? Initially, uh, okay, it's really quite simple. It's, the explanation was as of the last question. When your spirit, your intellect, accepts and believes upon Yeshua Messiah, intuitively then the power of God moves into you and gifts are given. My particular gift happened to be the gift of teaching. What are my credentials? My ability to do so is my gift from the Holy Spirit to make God's Word open up whereby anyone can understand it. That's a gift from God. No one can take that away from you. You can lose it yourself. But that's when you are baptized, is when your gift is given. Marie from Mississippi. I have a friend, Jane, who is dying of cancer and needs prayer. Please pray for her. Thank you, Marie, for asking. Father, touch this one. Touch this Jane. As we gather from Newfoundland all the way to Brazil, this family, faith in you, touch and see you in Jesus' uh, precious name. Okay, uh, Jane from Florida. Could you give me some scripture verses on a bad habit of procrastination? I promised myself to do better, but I can't shake it. Uh, please help. Jane, Jane, bless your heart. You know what I'm going to do to you? I'm going to give you the acrostic psalm that we read tonight, and I'm going to teach the 37th psalm very soon that will help you as well. Um, don't put things off. Start with the hardest things first. If you only get one thing a day done, then you never have a problem. So, um, just know and love him and know he sees you. I think that'll take care of it. Toby from Las Vegas. In Revelation 3.3, 3, in the Companion Bible, parallel column, reads, This verse is not addressed to the church which is his body, and then gives the scripture reference, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Then reads, see 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 1 Timothy 3, 16. 
what do they mean by this, and to what church is this verse addressed? Well, um, I'm going I'm to have to look just a moment, because, uh, and lock it in mind here, you don't see me have to do this too many times, but I want to be certain of a point. Okay, 3.3, three, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast that which you have, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come. I still think it was Sardis, but it was made up of witchcraft. It was a great place of commerce, and I think it took a lot of things into consideration other than that. Okay? Um, so, uh, many times, I want you to study on your own. Now, the companion Bible is good, and it's real good, but there are a few errors in it. Um, that's why I insist that you um, um, that you study on your own. But uh, I would have to disagree with them there in part. However, I understand where they're coming from. Part of these events will bring about the great apostasy as it took you uh, there to Second um, Thessalonians 2, 1, which, uh, if I remember right, reads, do not, I want to talk to you, Paul speaking, I want to talk to you about Christ returning to this earth. Okay, I'm going to take one more real quick. Doug from California enjoyed the Apocrypha of, on Wisdom of Solomon. Enjoyed the um, Smith Goodspeed Bible. Really enjoy the Psalms and would enjoy you teaching on Solomon's wisdom sometime. I'm going to do that. It's the greatest story ever told. Is that 30 seconds? I'm out of time. Hey, we're about ready to be out of here. I love you all, and I love studying God's Word with you. We're supported by your tithes and your offerings. We need a little growth. You all grow with us if you can. Not those that have been with us, but you people new that are listening. You help support God's Word. Stay in His Word. That's the most thing, most important thing. Every day and it's a beautiful day because Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette, or if you would like to know some of the other deeper, in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape catalog.